All right, so very good afternoon to you. Uh, I continue where we left uh, two weeks ago. And I think the very important thing that we, basically we posed a big challenge to the Nobel laureate that who were saying that the, the firm value cannot be altered through the, through the liability side of the balance sheet. But I think with one example, we were able to establish that a company uh, in the example that we covered last week, uh, the two weeks ago, that the company is able to, the, the levered company is able to value add uh, by $340, okay? And that basically was 34% of 1,000. And just to refresh your knowledge, 34% was the tax which company was paying and 1,000 was the amount of debt the company had. So in other words, if you want to see the difference in the, uh, in, in the value of a levered and unlevered company, uh, then all you need to do is you calculate the effective tax rate of the company which it's paying, not the, not the headline tax rate, but the effective tax rate. And if you multiply that with the amount of borrowings which firm has, then you would be able to create the value which the firm can generate from its liability side. And this is what was actually uh, totally uh, refuted by Modigliani and Miller. Uh, they were saying that, no, the, the only way you can add firm value is through the asset side and you and, and the financing. So basically, they were saying that investing is the way to add the value and financing is only a facade just to facilitate uh, the company's you know, uh, investing. But otherwise, financing per se uh, add no value to the firm, but then we had a very simple example, like basic secondary school mathematics type of example. And we were able to establish, we were able to establish that. A company is able to generate interest tax shield. And if interest tax shield is like a perpetuity, if it goes forever, let's imagine that this scenario would remain forever, then if you are able to find the present value of the perpetuity, that is equal to, um, we used a formula that if you have a perpetual cash flow, which we assume that uh, we would be having the interest tax shield for the rest of the life. And if you discount it at the rate of interest, um, the discount rate could be many. I mean, we can have a discussion that what should be the rate of discount, but I think the since it's very clearly specified that the rate of interest which company is paying is 8%, then what could be a better rate of discount than the rate of interest? And when, when we discount it, we calculate that uh, the overall, um, you know, the overall value addition for the rest of, for, for all the life, uh, if you are, if you find the present value of the perpetuity, which is the interest tax shield, okay, uh, then it becomes debt tax shield. The interest tax shield is for one year, but if you find its present value for its for the remaining life of the company, then it becomes perpetuity, and then we call it debt tax shield. So if you have the interest tax shield for a year uh, divided by the rate of interest, uh, which the company is paying, and that would be the value addition, which the firm can bring uh, from its liability side. And this is a very big uh, revolution that how the company is able to produce more value through its uh, uh, liability side of the balance sheet, which was not accepted by Modigliani and Miller. Um, so this is uh, is the theory. So I have explained all these things. It's just a text for your information. Uh, and task eight, by the way, uh, is based on this. Uh, you can go through it, but basically uh, I can do task eight for you straight away uh, by myself. 
you need to do it for the three year period, uh, but I can quickly do it for one year. Um, so if I stop this sharing and I share with you the um, if I share with you the British Petroleum's uh, financial statements, then I need two things. Uh, the two things I need to add is, uh, maybe let me zoom in, perhaps you can see better then. So you need to see is the effective corporate tax rate, which the firm is paying. And the second thing is that the amount of debt uh, the finance debt which the company has. So um, if you find, for example, the profit before tax is 8154, and here is the taxation. And if you divide this tax by the, if you divide this 3964, so if I can also open a spreadsheet. Uh, and you can see here is that the profit before tax is 8154. Uh, I can quickly write the profit before tax. 8154. And then we have uh, taxation, which is 3964. Is 3964. And if I share my spreadsheet with you, so it means that the effective, not the headline, then the effective corporate tax rate, which in the slide is symbolized by TC, T subscript C, would be equal to the amount of tax the firm is paying by the profit before tax. So it means that, um, BP is paying uh, about, oh, sorry, I think it should, shouldn't happen with this. It sh should be just a sec. Uh, three, four. And then I convert it to percentage. So nearly 48.614% uh, uh, amount of tax, uh, percentage of tax which company has paying in 2019 and not every British company pays this much of tax. So if you just Google uh, corporate tax rate in Britain, then you will not have this figure. So we need to, it, it has to be customized based on the company to company, okay? And same way, if I even try for the last year, well, 2019, I can try and then you can, find out the total debt. Uh, the total debt must be the total finance debt. Uh, again, there is a different views about the researcher. Some people say that only long-term debt uh, is something which we should consider because uh, some researchers say that, no, we, we need to include both kinds of debt, the, the current debt and the non-current debt. Uh, on the other hand, some researchers believe that the current debt is only to to finance your uh, operational, um, you know, activities, your your operational requirements, and if you want to see for some long-term investment point of view, then you should only consider the non-current debt. So I give you a leeway uh, for this task whether you pick up the current debt or the non-current debt. Uh, but let's, uh, for the sake of example. Uh, if we only if we if we take both types of debt and for this purpose we need to go to the balance sheet
I hope you can see the balance sheet here. I guess I'm sharing with you. And here, if you see the, the liability side, you can see the finance debt, which is uh, in the current form and also in the non-current form. So uh, it's about 10,500 and this is about mm, 57. So if altogether, if I make an estimate that uh, there is about 62,000 uh, debt, the finance debt, then um, I can find, I can calculate the debt tax shield. Uh, sorry, let me share the spreadsheet now. I'm sharing three different things with you. Files, PDF and, and slide and spreadsheet here. So then the debt tax shield would be, um, would be equal to the DC, the corporate tax rate, but effective times the amount of debt. So in other words, uh, about $30,000 uh, million dollars have been added uh, by, the, by the debt. And if this company, uh, BP, was an unlevered company with no debt, Okay, so you can assume here, you can have a what if analysis. You can have a what if analysis that if this company was, uh, you can say that if this firm was a unlevered company with no borrowing, then this amount would have been missing from the book value of the company. And the book value of the company is the total assets, or uh, you can see from the total liabilities plus the, uh, the shareholders equity. So this value would have been missing. And you can see it's a big difference. It's a massive amount of difference which uh, the borrowing is making to the firm, okay? So, yeah. So this example we did, and that's what you will be doing, that you'll be taking your, your case company, calculate for three different years, uh, the, these three variables, and then calculate that how much debt tax shield has been created by the firm uh, for three different periods, okay? Um, and I just use, you don't have to, I think, I mean, if you want to complicate the uh, example, uh, you can calculate the interest tax shield and then divide by the average interest rate which the company is paying. But I think that will be a bit unnecessary since the final uh, equation we have is the debt tax shield is equal to uh, the effective corporate tax multiplied by the amount of debt. Now, about the amount of debt, uh, I, I would say that you can, I let you use your discretion uh, because some researchers they only who are very puritan they believe that the non current debt is the only debt which is used for the investing purpose so i leave it to i leave it to you uh, i mean both sides have their argument so in this example i took total finance debt so it's up to you how you want to treat it as long as you do it consistently for 3 years and when you multiply them that gives us the debt tax shield here we go it's a big amount And this is something you need to do for task eight. So choose a levered company, which the company is anyways, uh, calculate the value of debt tax shield and see that how much difference. So for, for example, when you see this spreadsheet and this value is about 30,000 uh, million basically. So it basically means that uh, if this, company BP was unlevered, then this number 30,000 something would have been missing. So this is a scenario uh, which you analyze. Of course, there are some, um, it's not very simple. Uh, 
that's, it's not just an arithmetical equation. Uh, if the firm doesn't borrow permanently or doesn't even have the enough income to pay the taxes, uh, then the present value calculations would be smaller. Okay, But this 30,000 something that we calculated is based on the notion that uh, the certain, that X amount of interest sh shield is available to the company for the rest of the life. But that is, a, that is an assumption, it's a notion. Um, if the amount of profits change, or let's say a situation when the company doesn't have uh, profit enough to be qualified, you know, qualified to be taxed, or other extreme when the company is having losses, uh, then this concept of debt tax shield um, doesn't really work. Or sometimes it happens that you are having the losses in the in the in certain years, um, and if you have the losses, you uh, you can cover it by the amount of taxes which you have paid in the last three or four years. Like 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 in the U.S., for example, um, if you are having losses, uh, you can recoup uh, or you can get the compensation. You can recoup. You can you can recover. Uh, from the tax which you have paid in the last six years. So in that case, uh, the concept of debt tax shield uh, becomes irrelevant, okay? But at least from this very contrived and very basic exercise, you can find out that if the company is having the positive profit and that positive profit is fairly consistent uh, over a period of time, uh, then how much value extra the firm is able to generate from its financing side. And needless to say, uh, the value of the firm uh, is equal to the value of unlevered firm. So in this case, uh, we, we can assume that the company has no debt. And then we, we find out that about $30,000, well, they are actually million dollars, not just 30,000 that have been created by the present value of debt tax shield, okay? So, yeah, so this is something, uh, this, is, this was one simple example uh, where, where, where you can actually come in conflict uh, with the Modigliani and Miller's proposition. Modigliani and Miller uh, were saying that uh, the value of a finance value of a levered firm and an unlevered firm is same uh, because leverage itself doesn't add any value to the company. Whereas we have seen with the very, even though with very simplistic way that actually it's not. The firm can generate more value from its financing side also. All right, so we carry on. And the next sub point, uh, the subtopic that we will be discussing is called debt capacity. Uh, now here, um, I take the other side of the picture. So far, it seems that I, I'm actually really, you know, kind of praising, eulogizing the the, the debt that, hey, leverage is good, leverage is great, leverage is really, you know, fantastic. You, something is missing in your life if you don't have debt. But in this topic, I try to bring forth the other side of the debt also. As the title of this subtopic says, debt capacity, it means that now here we talk about that what is the capacity of the borrowing, how much the firm is capable of borrowing. And the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, a firm must not borrow beyond its debt capacity. Even though the debt is very luring, the debt is very uh, glamorous because it is adding the value to the company, but it will not be true if you go beyond your debt capacity because then the side effect of over leverage uh, is the financial distress costs. The financial distress costs mean that if you borrow more, of course, you can have debt tax shield. But when you are borrowing beyond a point, then you are 
exposing your cash flows to the repayment pressure. Remember when you borrow, it's not like equity. When you borrow, you have to pay, uh, you have to repay the amount of borrowing uh, and also the interest thereon. So there are two cash flows going out. So as a part of the debt, uh, you retire a certain amount of debt each year and you also pay the interest on it. And if you don't have the sufficient amount of cash flows, cash inflow, I mean, uh, then it can put the company in a stress. And if this stress is accumulating, then ultimately it, it emerge as a financial distress, okay? And the financial distress cost is enough to make a firm bankrupt, absolutely. So even though you are adding some debt tax shield, but if the firm doesn't exist anymore, that all the debt, debt tax shield which you're talking about is basically makes no difference, make, makes no sense. So firm doesn't exist. And if you are going to borrow beyond a certain level, then your shareholders, they would be demanding more risk premium from you as well. So it's possible that the, the existing investors or the potential investors, uh, when they are calculating their minimum return, which they must expect from you by applying CAPM model or any other um, uh, you know, uh, theoretical model, then they would be placing a very high risk premium on upon you. Okay, so it could be possible that it's like you are earning in one hand and you know, you're saving, you're, you're generating more cash flow from the more debt, but then that amount of debt tax shield, you are basically paying as a compensation to your equity investors so that they either invest in your company or remain with your company. Because if they start selling the stakes, then the firm's share price would go down. It would be going southwards. And that's not a very good situation. So what we did in the spreadsheet is very notional. Uh, the dynamics, the actual dynamics would be very different. Uh, so here we need to know that the company, the firm has its debt capacity. Um, no public listed company will go all out for the debt finance because if it goes beyond its capacity, which is very customized, it, 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 it varies from even in the same industry, even in the same sector, uh, two different companies, they have different debt capacity. Of course, there are some generic uh, factors as well, but there are many uh, inborn, many inherent uh, characteristics of the company as well, which determine the debt capacity. It means that how much, what is the stretchability of the company? How much you can be filled with the extra debt, okay? Uh, if you are, if too much debt is filled, uh, and the company is overstretched, then it could lead to, it can lead to basically the total collapse, total collapsation of the company. So here we need to know what is the debt capacity and what it is based on. Um, debt capacity um, is not an absolute amount. Um, even for the same company, the debt capacity may vary from time to time and situation to situation. In the good times, your debt capacity would be different, but in the bad times, it can vary. Uh, so debt capacity also depend upon the overall financial situation of the firm, but also if you want to have a project financing, certain project you want to finance, and, and that the nature of the project is very different from the rest of the uh, projects which the company is running, uh, again, your debt capacity would be different. So it's, it's the several factors which uh, it comes uh, to, 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 to my mind. Uh, there are several factors on which uh, debt capacity determines, uh, depends. The first one comes to my mind is the profitable. Um, if, you have, if you are a more profitable company and you're earning good amount of profits, uh, which shows, which is a validation of your company's good operations, uh, then you are able to borrow more because you have given some sort of evidence that, hey, you give me more debt, 
I would be using the debt for the investment purpose uh, because I have immaculate operational parameters. That is why I'm able to generate more profit. So don't worry, the profit rate which I'm earning is much higher than the, uh, the cost of interest, which the firm is paying. So in other words, uh, with the high profits, with a successful track record of profitability, you are silencing uh, the naysayers who says, no, no, no debt is good. Debt is not good for the company, okay? But when you are earning good amount of profits, then you say, that, hey, we can, even though debt is attractive and it's like a white elephant, it can have the side effects, but you know what? We have the good amount of profits to pay back. So what's the fuss? So that should be a good uh, measure. So if the company is consistently having good profits, then you can reckon the company as a good candidate uh, of high level of leverage. Uh, this point should be second, but I just combine it with the first point. I don't know why, but anyways, the second point which uh, can determine your uh, you know, debt capacity is the tangible assets. So if a firm uh, is having more tangible assets, um, it means that the firm has more assets to be used as a collateral uh, in order to borrow. Uh, if you know that we, we, give, we use the fixed assets or the tangible assets as a collateral, then we borrow, okay? Uh, the bankers or the other lenders are not very much amused if you are using the intangible assets as a collateral, maybe at a very, very uh, you know, when you are at a very mature stage, perhaps you can borrow against your trademarks, your copyrights, your patents, but in the beginning stage or in the intermediate stage, uh, it is too much, it's very far-fetching for a company to borrow successfully against its intangible assets. Uh, used as the collateral, okay? So the firm which has more tangible assets comparatively uh, is a better borrower. So if I have, uh, if you are the bank manager and BP is approaching you and at the same time, somebody from Microsoft is approaching you and you have to make a choice between the two, then all else being equal, you would be, your, your preferred borrower would be BP, not Microsoft. Uh, then the next stage, uh, which could make a difference uh, between a good borrower or a bad borrower is the stage of the project. Uh, usually the initial uh, stage of the, uh, you know, the capital requirements, they are funded by your own internal equity. Um, if you don't have your own, really own, uh, internal equity, then you can approach those, uh, uh, you know, these, these new forms of uh, funding like the angel investors or the venture capitalist. Uh, but at a subsequent stages, when you have given a proven, uh, when you have given the enough evidence of your success, uh, then you are a good uh, borrower. So because then you have some history, you have some legacy, uh, which can be, which can vindicate your, your stance. Um, yeah. So in other words, uh, those companies which are, uh, which have a history, which have a legacy and which are fairly known, well known, um, they, they are uh, better borrowers. Uh, but that's not everything. Uh, we might have some more points which can determine your debt capacity. And I want you guys to, to pay attention to it. Um, I want that you, you, if you can bring some more points of the debt capacity, but we can quickly write down. Um, do you see any, any other point which can determine the debt capacity?
or maybe I, I'm not sure if I told you this thing before, but to me, uh, if I see a very good borrower, uh, then in Finland or <laughs> specifically in Yuvaskula, I think the COAS, which is a uh, student housing, uh, Central Finland uh, student housing company or organization. To me, COAS is a is a fantastic borrower. So I would say that all else being equal, COAS as a amazing uh, debt capacity. Why so? If Kuas building was Kela building, basically, just imagine. In Kuas, there are tenants. People live there, they have a housing lease, they, they are rent payers. So those people who live in a block, they are rent payers. So they Kuas is getting cash flow from them. But if that building was not Kuas, but Kela, I'm just making comparison, then those people who would have been there, they would have been salaried people and that Kela would have been paying money to them. So if in a block there are 50 tenants, then in this, for the same building, there would have been 50 wage earners. So they would, the same cash inflow would have been cash outflow. And secondly, I find that uh, people who live in this housing building, um, they are the students. Uh, they have very regular stream of rent payment. So I think the, the, the company has very strict rules. Uh, it's very difficult that you, you, you can carry forward your rent. You, your rent is always paid in time. Usually it's all cash based. So the flow of flow of cash inflow is very stable. Similarly, I find that in co-op building, if you have one or two, maybe two or three uh, janitors, they can basically look after all the complaints of the broken windows or uh, not functioning of Wi-Fi or you know, some, some other stuff. So it's very straightforward. So the operating cash flow, uh, the sorry, the 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 their operational expen expenses are very much moderate, and also I see that for the for this company Coas, most of their assets are tangible, and because they have their main asset is the is the building, the tangible assets, which can be used as a collateral. So therefore, uh, unlike Microsoft or unlike any IT company whose formula or copyrights, they don't have any collateral value unless they really prove something. But that's a very later stage. But for COAS, the building is a tangible asset and it's a very much collateral asset if you want to increase your borrowings. So that makes uh, COAS a much better borrower than a, a comparable company which is doing something else. So if you are a more profitable company and you have a very rich block of tangible assets, uh, you are not a debutant. You are in the business for many years. I look at company like General Electric, uh, or the firm like uh, LG, uh, they are in, in the corporate scene for nearly 100 years, or some of them are even more than 100 years. Since they are existing for 100 years, that is a vindication that they have withstood all the bad times successfully. So what could be a better evidence for a company's history a legacy? So people who are financing such companies they have more trust in them that, hey, this company is there in the scene for the last 100 years. 
So a uh, one wave or two wave, any other unfavorable wave, which is a uh, temporary phenomena will not be enough to kill this company. Whereas if you're a new company, you are a startup, or even you are, you are, are, are having a history of last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, perhaps that may not be enough to back up your uh, historical, uh, your success, but your uh, consistent success over time period. And then if you are having a uh, very regular, stable, steady cash inflows, your operational cost is less. That is like an icing on the cake that makes things even better for you. Okay. So to me, um, when I see at the very local level, um, I'm really impressed by the debt capacity of uh, COAS. Uh, believe me, COAS has not paid me anything uh, to make their advertisement. And also, I think the debt capacity depends on your uh, existing amount of debt. If a firm is already neck deep in debt and it is going to borrow more, then there is always some kind of apprehensions because you see what, in, in, the, in the debt, uh, there are senior claimants and then there are junior claimants. Imagine I'm a bank and I have given already a huge amount of debt to a firm and that firm, and you see what, uh, when I gave debt to this company in the debt covenants, we use a phrase called debt covenants, which means that when we make an agreement with the company, uh, I might have said that, hey, next time, if you borrow more from a different bank, first you need my permission. And this company comes to me and it says that, you know what, we need, more borrowing. So if you can't give more debt, can I borrow from uh, some other XYZ bank? And if I agree uh, to this more debt, basically I'm harming my interest because then there are more claimants. You see what the debt is paid before the, the equity is repaid or the dividend is given. So in that case, if the amount of debt is increasing, then it's a risk to the existing debt holders. And it is a risk to the new debt holders also. If a company approaches me, which has already borrowed from many other banks, comes to me, asks for more debt, then I would say that, hey, you know what? I'm afraid that if I give you debt, and in case that you become bankrupt, then that bank A, B, or C are my senior claimants because they gave you debt before I'm going to give you. And if there would be some assets, uh, you know, appropriation that, okay, the, in the event of uh, uh, when the company is bankrupt, uh, maybe I get nothing or I get very less. And I would only pay you, uh, I would only give you debt if you, uh, compensate me for this extra risk, and then you give me more interest. And when the bank agree to pay me more interest, then it is inviting more pressure on its cash flows. The junior, the senior, all the claimants uh, would be at risk. So the question is that when the company is borrowing more and more, and the debt is going beyond a certain capacity, then the tug of war is not between the equity investor and the debt investors alone. It's not an intra, it's not an inter-investor war. It can also be an intra-investor conflict also. So there could be, there could, there could, there could be conflict between uh, the different types of debt holders, the junior and the senior uh, debt holders. So we need to be very careful that uh, all is not very rosy uh, when a company is borrowing more and more. Uh, as a banker, I would be very much uh, kind of averse of giving extra dose of debt to a company which is already, you know, lot of under a lot of debt. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next uh, quick topic that we can uh, cover up. Uh, is the weighted average cost of capital because in this course we studied how to calculate the return on equity, uh, what is the rate of debt, 
the interest, the rate of interest that we pay on debt and how we combine all of them in one equation. And here you can see that there's a weighted average cost of capital formula, uh, which is, as the name says, it's like a weighted arithmetic mean. So if you know that how much uh, rate of return you pay to the equity investors, and if you know that how much uh, the rate of interest you pay to your debt holders, and if you know that what is the proportion of the equity and debt in the company's financing, and if you are able to calculate the effective corporate tax rate, which we did in one example before, then you are able to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. The only difference is that when you are calculating the, the share of cost of debt, you are basically subtracting uh, one minus TC. Uh, if your corporate tax rate is 25%, then actually you are only paying 75% of the rate of interest. Because 25% is calculated before, uh, the, the tax is calculated before uh, the company uh, uh, is giving the interest payments. In other words, that 25% is a saving. So in other words, if you are having uh, 25% is the effective corporate tax rate. And the rate of interest, which you are paying is let's say 10%. Then effectively you're not paying 10%. You are only paying one minus 25%. You're only paying 75% of 10%. So in other words, you are effectively paying not 10%, but 7.5% rate of interest because we know we studied and we, we saw many times, I think, uh, in case of BP's example and some more companies example that, uh, that, uh, that basically the debt uh, repayment uh, is, the debt cost is subsidized because of the, this corporate tax uh, it treats the two forms of financing, debt and equity separate uh, differently. Okay. You can go through this. So I, do, I, do, I don't see there is anything um, which I haven't discussed before. So we take a short break and then we have the last, in principle, the last topic of this, uh, of our syllabus. So let's take a few minutes break, maybe 10 minutes, and then we come back and then we just go through this remaining part. Now, so the last part of this topic is that um, if, you, if you look at the G section, which was about the working, uh, the weighted average cost of capital, before G, if you look at all the points, A, B, C, D, E, F, of this topic, uh, one may tend to believe that I am really in praise of uh, debt. In G, I think I've been giving some kind of word of caution because the, the debt capacity comes in the picture. And now in the H, I will see, I, I will discuss with you that how the negative impact of too much of debt can come forward so if the corporate tax rate is pro debt, then the personal income tax seems to be sometimes pro equity. And eventually, so all the, all the benefit, all the, what I use the phrase debt tax shield, uh, all the value addition, which the investors feel, which investors experience through more debt can be eroded by the, financial distress cost, and if there's anything left, can be eroded, can be taken over by uh, the personal income tax. And it could be possible that if you are, if the value of a levered company is this much, and the value of unlevered company is this much, then the gap, this excess of value of a levered company 
can be eliminated by financial distress cost and the personal income tax. Remember, when you, not in terms of uh, company, uh, but as an investor, you have uh, two phases of taxation. If I'm a shareholder of a company, then the dividend which I get from the firm is uh, post tax. So it means the dividend which I get has already been, you know, uh, tax is like a tax deducted at source, the corporate tax rate. But then at the end of the year, I also file my income tax return. And I also pay another form of tax called personal income tax. If I, if my, if I have already contributed more tax than I should have had, then I would get the tax refund. But if I, if I still have paid less than what I should have paid, then I pay more taxes. So it's not about, it's not just uh, the buck doesn't stop at the corporate tax alone. It also goes to the personal income tax also. So in this debate, in each section, we may reach a situation that when the overall income, the overall value generated through the equity could be more than the value added by the debt. Okay, so here in this section, we will have interaction of the, uh, of the corporate tax rate and the personal income tax together. So this is the kind of backdrop. So now, we, now I slowly in G and H, I'm trying, I'm trying myself to come out of the uh, the the fancy and the fantasy world of uh, debt. If you see this uh, screenshot, which I took from the Brilliant Myers book, sorry I didn't mention the edition, but I think it's this book, uh, this kind of uh, this. Uh, screen, this illustration is in, in every edition. Okay, start from the operating income. There is a amount which goes to the bondholders and the debt and the, and the equity holders. Uh, the interest which the bondholders get they don't get any exposure of the corporate tax. I hope you can see that uh, where my, the cursor is moving because interest is tax, the corporate tax exempted. So in other words, uh, because there is no impact of corporate tax, so the, if you pay $1 to the, to the bondholders uh, in the stage two, it, it still is a $1, but here, then comes the personal tax, the personal income tax rate, TP, which the debt holder will also be exposed to like any other taxpayer. And the ultimate cash flow, which the bondholder get is one minus TP. And T subscript P is the tax rate, the personal income tax rate, which the bondholder is paying. Okay. So finally, one minus TP is the, what is the word in economics we use? Disposable income, the final income after all the taxes. And then if the same $1 is going to the equity investor, uh, the first hurdle is uh, TC. And I'm sure you know this uh, abbreviation, it's corporate tax rate. And then the post corporate tax rate cash flow in stage two is one minus TC. So this is the income, one minus TC, which goes to uh, the equity investor. And then that is not all. The equity investor also pay the personal income tax. So that is TPE. So here I slightly, uh, not me, but the authors, Brilliant Myers, they're slightly distinguished uh, that instead of TP, they call it TPE, which means uh, the tax rate on the personal, the personal income tax on equity. So E stands for equity. 
And when you solve this equation, uh, this one, you know, TPE, things like that. So ultimately it comes like uh, this equation. So when you solve it, it becomes this. Now there is no, there is no guarantee that this disposable income, which goes to the bondholder will always exceed this disposable income, which goes to the shareholders. So there is no, it could be possible that it's more. So there can be more than sign or equal to sign, or it could be possible that the bondholder disposable income is less than, less than the disposable income which goes to the equity investor. And if it happens, then we slightly, or if it is equal, just imagine a situation that both sides are equal. Then basically what Modigliani and Miller were saying was true. Because then financing doesn't matter. At the end of the day, uh, the bond holder and the equity holder are getting the same cash flow. What was our antithesis to, to Modigliani and Miller theorem? that the firm value which the leverage is creating is more than um, if, if the firm was unlevered. And if this equation is equal or there is a less than sign in between, so the bondholders disposable income is less than uh, the stockholders income, then our criticism against Modigliani and Miller become redundant. So then we can, we can feel that, hey, our criticism that we, were, we started is not valid anymore. So this could be possible, okay? So let's, let's take some example. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we can straight away go to the example, it doesn't matter. So um, imagine, that there's a $1 going to the interest to the bondholder and $1 is going to the equity holder. And just that the corporate tax rate is 46% and the personal income tax on uh, debt income is 50% and the equity income is tax exempted. Like there are some countries uh, where if you are getting any dividend income, uh, that income tax is almost 0%. Like in Singapore, uh, the TPE, the personal income tax, which falls on the, uh, the share investment is, I don't know now, but some seven, eight years ago, uh, and even more recent, it was 0%. So, yeah. So let's see what happens. Uh, there's no burden of corporate tax so it's one remains one, then there's a 50% um, personal income tax, so it's 50. So it means that at the end of the day, uh, the bondholder who gets $1 interest, uh, the disposable income is uh, 50 cents. Okay, fair enough. And if you are an equity investor, you get one, uh, but then from one you pay uh, 46% as a corporate tax rate, then your uh, uh, income is 54, which you get from the, uh, on the equity. And then if the personal income tax on equity is 0%, then this 54 and this 54, four is zero. And if you divide this by this, so if I divide 0 0.50 with 0 0.54, then equation looks like this then the equation is like this. And if this is called R, a relative tax advantage, if this R is less than one, if this R is less than one, then the overall, overall tax advantage, inclusive of corporate tax rate and personal income tax, is in favor of 
equity investor. So in this case, if I divide this part by this part, uh, the ratio R, a relative tax advantage, which I'm using here, this one, will be less than one. And if it is less than one, then the overall advantage, when I say overall tax advantage, it means inclusive of both corporate tax rate and the personal income tax rate is going more in favor of for the advantage <laughs> equity owner. And even if you don't divide it, even if you don't divide this by this, just see the difference. The equity owner is getting four cents more than the debt holder. So in this case, definitely, when I see this example, definitely I tend to believe what Modigliani and Miller were saying, and I find that, hey, I think my criticism uh, to the Modigliani and Miller theorem was uh, not comprehensive because all my criticism was restricted to the corporate tax rate. I did not consider the personal income tax rate. And when I do, I find that the equity owner is at the end of the day is getting four cents more than uh, what the debt holder is getting. The same way you can try this. So just by changing uh, the percentages, just by changing the diff the rate, the tax rates, we can find out that sometime here the debt is, this ratio will be more than one and likewise. So the, the argument I'm trying to give you is that even though it could be, it still it still could be possible that the disposable income of debt holder is more than the equity holder. But this discussion is more complete, more comprehensive, and more comparable, and more competitive, because it could be possible, like we saw in the previous example, that the equity owner was able to get more money. But it, it's still possible that the debt holder can get still more. But this, this advantage uh, is not as massive or as one-sided uh, as we saw during the debt tax shield discussion, which was totally pro debt. And we, we, we were, I mean, I showed you with one example that about $30,000 million uh, BP was able to generate only because of debt. It's a crazy amount. But then you can criticize that, hey, your discussion is not based on full taxation dynamics. It just, it's all only based on uh, when you talk about the corporate tax rate. So when corporate tax rate is fine, but I think we need to go beyond it and we need to also consider the personal tax rate as well. So this is all about the discussion which we had. And with this, we've complete our topic. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, but I can clarify my agenda that in a day or two, or maybe even tonight, I would be adding some uh, research articles, more topical research articles. And at the same time, in a day, uh, and, and if somebody reminds me in two, three days, just wake me up about Thursday, Friday, then I would be discussing some, I would be sharing with you some sample exam questions as well. So next week we will meet uh, the same time, uh, but that would be kind of revision uh, lesson. So, hypothetical situation. If you have no question, or all your queries are, you may consider to come or not for the lecture meeting. Of course, it would be good to see you. So, we complete this topic.